Hey everyone, I'm Ritwik Gupta. I work here at the Emerging Technology Center. And I'm Eric Heim, also at the Emerging Technology Center. And we're here to talk to you today about inverse reinforcement learning. Eric, I heard you've been working on some really, really cool stuff that basically lets agents learn from their environment. Mm -hmm. Can you tell me a little bit more about that? Yeah, so um, inverse reinforcement learning is a particular formal formalization of a problem known as imitation learning. And so imitation learning is the task of learning from observed behaviors. So uh, imagine you wanted to learn how to drive a car. Uh, one of the ways to do that is to actually watch somebody actually drive a car. So uh, you could actually, you know, watch, have someone drive a car, see which turns they make to certain destinations. You can see things like, you know, the th uh, phenomenon, like they don't run into poles. They decide to stay in these lanes and certain things. Hmm. Um, now, inverse reinforcement learning sort of differentiates itself from the broader scope of, of imitation learning in that uh, it models it in a very specific way. And so specifically, uh, so imitation learning could be, um, you could just be what's known as behavioral cloning. So the idea is that you could just take, at any time uh, the human or, or thing you're observing takes an action, you take the same exact action and you're just modeling exactly the behavior. Well, the, the thing of IRL is that they try to model the reward structure behind the decisions they make. So you can imagine when a, a human drives up to an intersection, they decide, well, they, can, they have some intrinsic reward associated with actions in that particular state they're in, which sure. is the intersection. Sure. So uh, they would say, you know, uh, well, it's a more rewarding action than running into a pole is making the correct right turn to my destination. And this formalism is really useful for a couple reasons. Um, one, it allows you to uh, generalize tasks. So if I'm just copying the behavior of, a, of an agent or an, some observations and I'm using that for an agent to do the task, uh, if I'm put in a situation which I haven't directly seen before, it may not know what to do. But if I learn sort of the intrinsic reward in the relationship between the actions and states that the human found themselves or the observed uh, behavior found uh, where the observed behavior found themselves in, then I can sort of uh, to I can generalize to other states and actions. So I can do things like, hey, I'm, I'm in a similar situation where I was than I was before, and because I know that my reward, I know my reward structure loosely and make decisions that way. Gotcha. So, I guess in in, in my world a little bit, let, let's say you know in an, in an ideal world, if I just watch Roger Federer play tennis sure. for like eighteen hundred matches, sure. right? Um, are you saying that I, you know, assuming I was using inverse reinforcement learning, I could learn kind of what things Roger Federer prioritizes when, you know, the environment is, is in a certain state and the certain actions that he can take in that specific state? Right? Yeah, absolutely. And so I think that there's a lot of interesting questions there. I think um, what you could learn is specifically in the formalisms that IRL provides, IRL being inverse reinforcement learning, um, you could learn that, you know, given if you the way you model the problem, if you say if Roger Federer is in this position on the court, the ball's coming in at this angle, it's coming, it's at this position, you could say he prefer he prefers going to his right and doing a forehand as opposed to going to his left and doing a backhand, because potentially the ball is going this way, right? And um, uh, more and so this is useful for a couple reasons actually. One of them is um, so if I wanted to have like a tennis playing robot, right? Okay. Um, I could then use the formalisms to have them mi mimic the same actions. Again, the idea of IRL is that it could generalize to a lot of different states and actions. Uh, so, if, for instance, if we just saw him do forehands um, and a couple backhands, uh, maybe then for certain situations where he needs to do a backhand that I haven't seen before, this, this uh, portability of the reward that we learn uh, potentially could be useful. Now, the other way that, so this is what's known as inverse optimal control. I want to do the okay. optimal actions for this control task of this robot. Now, I, I think that the other reason, this is sort of less uh, reflected in the literature for inverse reinforcement learning, is that there's, an, there's a lot of this, there's something to be said for understanding the model that, pe that experts have for certain, for certain behaviors. So if I wanted to say, so what is, what, are, what is something interesting? What are the interesting decisions that Roger Federer made as opposed to someone else? And what you can do is compare the rewards they assign to certain actions in certain states to potentially other choices they could have made. And this is useful for you know, learning how experts perform tasks and then teaching people potentially. So um, if uh, someone, someone who's a novice in tennis goes, man, I, I'm in this situation, what would Roger Federer do? Yep. Um, that could be useful for, for that. Um, in addition, things like um, if so, certain phenomena in biology that are not well understood. Um, 
if we wanted to get a lot of observation of them happening, then we could say well, we can probe this reward function, say things like, um, hey, so what, what are the most important actions or states that led to this behavior so right. we can observe those? No, this sounds, this sounds really interesting because it, it seems to me, and correct me if I'm wrong, that basically by just watching something happen or just observing something happen, we can kind of understand why they're happening yeah. by making no assumptions on the world itself besides – these are the possible states and these are the possible actions you can yeah. take in that space. And, and there's, and there's the, the thing that's sort of beneficial about inverse reinforcement learning as opposed to another reason is that um, it fits into the, this idea of reinforcing. So inverse reinforcement learning is actually an extension, or not an extension, a, uh, uses the same formalisms as, what's, as reinforcement learning. And um, so I, I think that, that there's a lot of benefit in using that um, in that, so while it is sort of this, well, Im, I would say imitation learning is very general, um, reinforced learning imposes particular structure that's useful for practical learning tasks. So actually, let's dig into that a little bit. What, why, you know, we've heard a lot of stuff about inverse reinforcement learning. We've also heard a lot of stuff about in, imitation learning from yep. you. What's the difference? Why, why, why is, there, is there a distinction between this general class of imitation learning, mm -hmm. which I guess what inverse reinforcement learning attempts to do, mm -hmm. but what's the difference between that general class and the specific uh, class of algorithms? Sure. Um, so... I think it's important to talk about that for inverse reinforcing these sort of formalisms that it assumes. It's, it's, it's useful to talk about reinforced learning or sometimes known as forward reinforced learning. And the idea there is that you model, you want to, so the idea is that you want to uh, take this particular formalisms of states and actions of what uh, a agent can find them in. So this could be a human agent or an intelligent agent or a software agent or a robot or anything um, and learn an optimal policy. So, um, Hold up. So, what, what is it? What does a policy mean? Sure. Um, so, a policy is a mapping of state and actions to probabilities. Or, okay. or conversely, you can think think of it as if I'm in this state, what is the action I can score an action? Right. Right. So, so basically, like you know, if I'm at a red light, what's the chances I'm going to go forward or turn left? Right. Right. And so, for the in the driving example, since you brought it up. Um, the states that the agent can find themselves in is positions on the road or potentially if you want to model it in such a way, the speed they're going and uh, the position of the lanes, maybe even the type of road they're on or the type of intersection they're up upcoming or they're approaching, the signs, that sort of thing, this, the, the same sensory input you would get if you were driving a car. This is how I observe the world. Those are the gotcha. states. Gotcha. The actions are the valid actions that I can take me from one state to the next. So. Um, if I'm if I'm in an intersection, I choose the action turn right. If that's the granularity in which you want to define actions, you could then say it takes me over to this road to the right, right? Um, and that's the particular formalism that they use. Now, there's you know the formalism goes it varies between different people how they formalize it, but there's also things the idea of you know uh, if I take the a right um, most often that if I determine this that's a deterministic. Uh, uh, what they know as a Markov decision process. That means I know that I'll go exactly on this road, but in sort of this, if you assume the dynamics are not fixed or deterministic, you could assume that the state in action doesn't, doesn't completely capture what the next state will be. So things like uh, a car could potentially cut you off or something you have to go around it or something like that. Okay. And the reason why this is useful, and I sort of went off on a little bit of a tangent, um, is that the forward reinforcement learning problem is learning this policy from observe states in action. So you have an agent drive around, and after doing this, and receive some reward back that, ooh, it was good that I got took a right because I didn't hit anybody, and eventually I went into my, my goal. The inverse problem is instead of having the agent do stuff in the environment, taking, you know, observing states in actions and getting reward back, the inverse problem is learning the reward from watching some an expert take some states and actions in the space. So these trajectories of an agent, of an expert driving, is with that there's no there's there's no observed reward in those cases. But you could learn their intrinsic reward that they that they guided them to those policies. That's, and, that's actually really interesting because what that tells me is that this intrinsic reward it, it's dynamic and it can change depending on what's going on in the environment. Yeah. So it actually, you know, continue the driving example. It sounds like perfect for self driving, right? Yeah. So. There's a lot of issues with with the practical applications of these methods. One of them is um, so modeling. There's a lot of assumptions in how you model the world, right? So, um, given all the sensors uh, you have on a car, potentially for self driving, um, there's a lot of things that aren't captured in those sensors, right? Potentially, and this is sort of the dynamics that's not represented in state. You know, so I think there's a lot of engineering involved in defining a proper state space, okay. uh, action space, and assumptions about transitions and stuff like that. Um, but uh, I think it's, the other issue is if you want to do forward reinforcement learning, 
Um, what ends up happening is that you need, a, for really big state and action spaces, meaning that you can be in a lot of different states and take a lot of different actions, um, there's, you have to have a lot of, uh, you have to have let the agent behave, be, take a lot of actions in a lot of states to actually learn an optimal policy. Gotcha. Inverse reinforcement learning allows you to alleviate some of that burden by watching an expert. But again, it still runs into the same problem of you often need a lot of observations to learn an, a, how to learn a, uh, a reward and thus a policy. Uh, that abstracts to a lot of different states and actions. So yes, yeah. I, I'd say it's useful for it. And IRL solves a particular problem with forward reinforced learning in that um, you know, it's not entirely exploring the state and action space to learn a policy. You can actually learn from observed behavior. Um, but there's also issues in computational complexity of these problems. Um, these are typically, in you know, relatively speaking, to a lot of other reinforcement learning or a lot of other machine learning methods, a computationally expensive algorithms. Um, so yes, while I think it can be applied to um, things like self-driving cars. Uh, I think there's a lot of technical and research hurdles, both on the engineering and sort of the basic science side, sure. that sort of need to be overcome before I think it's ready to like, you know, put it out in the street over there. So what would you say the biggest limitation is? Are you, are you saying that the, the science isn't there mainly, or is it that, you know, I, I know both of these issues are, are, are concerns, but is it mainly the computational cost right now, yeah. or is it mainly the, the lack of basic science? So I, I think that there's essentially two really you know, pressing issues within the inverse reinforcement re research right now. One of them is in the computational side. So um, reinforcement learning, generally speaking, um, is a very computationally expensive problem. Inverse reinforcement learning essentially iteratively solve, and this is the current techniques out there, iteratively solve for a reward and then solve the full reinforcement learning problem. So you're solving multiple reinforcement learning problems uh, each time you want to learn the, a reward for, for the actions that were observed. Um, now, uh, so this is this is in, incredibly computationally expensive. Okay. Um, so if there's techniques that we can alleviate the burden on the reinforcement learning side, so that step is easier. Or if we don't, if we find ways that we don't have to solve for reinforce forward reinforcement learning every time we want to do update or reward, um, that would be very useful. Um, I think I, the other issue is largely on um, sort of the data side. So. If I only see an expert, if I if I only see an expert drive on a particular route, right? How do I abstract that idea to all of Pittsburgh, say, right? Gotcha. And so yeah, that seems complicated, or, right? Or San Francisco, right? Sure, yeah. right. And so these different environments. So how do we how do we handle this? So there's a lot of different ways I think people are looking at this. There's um, how do we how do I inform uh, the reinforce the inverse reinforce learning problem with with prior knowledge about the world? Typically, you know, you may have not seen. Um, you know, some of the roads in San Francisco, right? But you still know how to navigate relatively, you know, between them because you have some innate knowledge or prior knowledge about how roads work, right? So how do we instill that Hopefully. type of... Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'd hope, or otherwise uh, I'll be driving if we go on trips together. Yeah, um, um, yeah so I, I think that... Uh, so how do I get that sort of... In this sort of what some people call common sense about driving into these things, so in, injecting things like prior information about the world uh, into these techniques. So this allows this, this, uh, the generalizability to increase for these things. Gotcha. Mm -hmm. well, I mean, you said, you, you, we talked about a lot of things, and, and I know you mentioned a lot of words like Markov decision processes, yeah. forward reinforcement learning, states, policies, et cetera. If someone wanted to go learn more about this, and I want to go learn more about this, what, what, what should they look up? Yeah, so I think there's, so, I, you know, one of the great things about the way the machine learning community has has evolved is that there's tons of resources out on the internet for these things. So, okay. um, but if you want to sort of the more classical sources, like in the research, um, forward reinforced learning, uh, there's a really great textbook from uh, uh, Sutton and Bartow. Okay. Um, uh, and the title itself is escaping right now, but if you Google reinforcement learning Sutton and Bartow, you'll probably get there. Um, that it's a really good, really, really good, thorough uh, description of reinforced learning and inverse reinforced learning. There's certainly blogs out there that'll get your foot in the door, um, but also sort of the more fundamental works um, are based off of. Uh, uh, I think let me let me let me try to remember. So there's Bayesian inverse reinforcement learning is okay. a good is a good resource. Uh, that's a really classic paper for inverse reinforcement learning. There is Max Causal Entropy reinforce inverse reinforcement learning. Um, that's another paper. Um, there's tons of there's tons of work since those. Those are sort of the classic basic methods for a lot of a lot of the the research that's built off of them. Um, but I think starting there and sort of working your way up through the literature, I think is a good good resources. But of course. Uh, there's tons of informative blogs and, and sort of more of more of introductory material, but the research is sort of you can you can follow the paper lineage I think from forward and backward from those two works. Gotcha. 
And uh, do you have any introductory blogs that you yourself have put out, or uh, not at the moment? Okay. I'm, I'm currently I'm currently assembling a practitioner's guide, um, but and with hopeful release. But um, if I if we are able to do that, I would I would gladly put that out for people to read. Um, and all I really have to say is Roger Federer, watch out! <laughs> Inverse reinforcement learning, Ritwik Gupta, world number one, coming soon. <laughs> For more information on inverse reinforcement learning, please hit us up at info at sei.cmu.edu or just check the links in the description below. Uh, we're more than happy to add anything that you guys might have questions about. Hope to hear from you soon.